So today, what we will talk about is exercise eight, supervised learning. Um, if you have any questions in between, I can uh, currently not see like the chat of Zoom. Just go ahead, unmute and interrupt me or use a moment of silence uh, to just raise your question. Um, yeah, so what about supervised learning? Basically, this is a reinforcement learning course. So we are actually not mainly dealing with supervised learning um, as this chart from the lecture shows. Um, however, what we will do is we will have to use supervised learning in the future for function estimation. I mean, we have talked about this today um, that as soon as we go into continuous um, environments, for example, you have a continuous state space, or you might also have a continuous action space, or you might have both, um, that you might have to estimate uh, the value function or the action value function, or you might even have to estimate the policy in the future. And most of these are regression problems, um, which are from the domain of supervised learning which is why we have these this kind of um, special lecture and exercise here in between uh, these two phases of reinforcement learning, like without and with um, function estimation. And what we will have a look at today is um, like the whole, um, how would you say, the whole workflow of a data scientist, or maybe not the whole, but most of it, which um, if any of you ever plans to become one, uh, would probably at some point have to deal with. So um, was someone talking? Okay, no. Um, so basically what we will have a look at today is we will have a data set. So our data acquisition is basically almost done already um, and we will have a look at how you could deal with an exploratory data analysis once you have a data set how you could do feature engineering we will not need resampling today we will talk about this um, how you can do then machine learning and yeah, somewhat evaluate it we will have a small look at it um, we will not do any optimization however we will talk about it shortly and uh, luckily, none of us has to do a written report in the end. And I think we also don't have any result. Ah, oh, we have, we have some result visualizations. So let's put a mark in here too. So we will deal with most of it, at least roughly. And we will also introduce, uh, the usage of, um, neural networks. So, um, and this, exercise, you can learn how to program neural networks and how to train them using PyTorch, which is uh, quite a famous and performant um, neural network library, deep learning library, which I would also recommend if you're a beginner to uh, start learning with, um, because it's uh, quite performant and also easy to, I would say, easy to use compared to, for example, TensorFlow. Um, yeah, so you will also need this for future exercises and you will also most probably need it for your exam task um, unless you somehow want to solve the problem using recursively squares, for example. You could do that. However, it's quite probable that you will not use linear methods, but instead neural networks. So let me see what my next... Ah, yeah, we will need this later. Okay, so maybe let me remove what I did here first. Click wait. So what is in the exercise? We have a data set available already. So our data was acquired. Um, this data set is, let me see, do we have a good, uh, is available on Kaggle. Uh, I hope I pronounce it correctly. Um, I think this is like a website for machine learning where you can uh, try different data sets and try to solve them or play around with them um, using machine learning methods or doing machine learning competitions. I think you can do all of this on Kaggle. And um, we have a data set available there, which is from our department. 
which depicts um, data from a real motor, an electrical drive, um, from a permanent magnet synchronous motor. Um, and this is basically a table and it has different columns. And these columns are depicted there are, for example, are, are like the currents which flow in the in the motor um, in the Q coordinates. If you're interested in this, you can read this up here. You can get further information here. However, what's important for you to know so far is just we have these currents at time step K. We have these currents um, at the next time step. Um, and we have like the elementary vector applied on the motor um, in the last time step and in the current time step. So basically it's not that important for you to know since this is not like an, a, a deep dive into electric motors. This is like, uh, we want to show you how to deal with data sets or how to do it with supervised learning problems. Um, so you don't have to be an expert on motors. Um, um, so basically what you would do if you are like a data scientist in, a, in an engineering company, uh, there would probably be experts for all of this. And if you at some point think like, okay, what's, a, what's an elementary vector? What does it do? What do all of these values even mean? Then you would probably go and ask an expert and they would give you like some consulting advice, so to say, uh, where they explain everything to you. Um, maybe if what's important for you to know so far is like this elementary vector is basically just a switching state, physically speaking, where you just have like different switches, which you can uh, either put on, on or off. And in all of the different combinations which are possible, each of them is like a different elementary vector. So what has happened in this motor is that um, we have like at, at the last time step and at the current time step, we have um, different switching states. And this results into different um, uh, into different conversions from the currents in the D and Q uh, area from one time step to the next. So depending on how these switching states are, um, currents will change differently. And this is obviously strongly dependent on the motor which you observed. So these are real values. We have a huge, I think the original data set is um, really big, like many gigabyte. Um, what we have in this exercise is a condensed version of that, also a little cleaned, I think, um, so that you don't have to like uh, download gigabytes of data. But if you're interested to have a look at the original data and maybe try to do all of the steps which we introduce here um, on the original data, feel free to try this out. It's, I guess it's a good, uh, it's nice to, um, it's a nice exercise for you. Okay, and I think we also have optional literature here in this exercise. So if you're really interested in the system and about what's happening in this data and in the physical system, you can look this up here. Yeah, but what we do first um, in, in this exercise is that we want to load our data set into our code or into our RAM, so to say, so that we can work with it. And I think it was also introduced in, an, in a former exercise already. What we will utilize here is um, the pandas data frame, uh, the pandas library, which gives us an, a data frame object, which is nothing else uh, but a big table of our data, which is very um, efficient in terms of um, execution speed and it can deal with big data sets uh, really fast. So um, we don't have like a CSV available, but instead an archived zip file. However, it's still easily able, as you can see here with this read CSV function to just load um, this data frame. Um, what we can see is that it has 2,450,000 um, columns, uh, 
uh, rows, sorry, and seven columns. So the set, uh, with this head function, we just take a look at the first five entries, the first five rows, and what we can observe in the first look. So that would be always the first step which you do is like have a look at what is my data. And what you would see is like the data which we have talked about uh, above, so the column names like ID, IQ, the next ID, IQ, the switching states and um, the epsilon, which is the angle of the rotor of the motor. And what we can already observe just by um, having a look at it um, is that most columns are float, floating point values, um, but the switching states are integer numbers. So as I mentioned before, the switching states um, are just like um, different, uh, no, how was it called? The elementary vectors were just different switching states of physical or electrical switches, uh, which means the number one or two could be mapped to any switching state. So these are not ordinal numbers in any way, but they are categorical numbers, um, which we will later have to deal with. So let's, so basically what I want to say is the number three doesn't mean that it's higher than number one, but instead it's just a description of a different switching state. Okay. So what you can do and uh, with the pandas data frame is that you have these original columns, but you might want to have new columns based on existing ones, or maybe even not based on existing ones, but instead of just adding some numbers for whatever reason. And um, this exercise gives you two different ways to do this, either by doing um, this assign function by using this, or by, if you've worked with dictionaries before, by um, using this dictionary-like syntax where you just uh, say, okay, on this pair's alternative column, I would like to have this these values. And yes, so these are the different ways you could assign columns here. We have here added a column um, where we have the different switching states um, from the last time step to the current time step. I think you can see it here, n k minus one, so to say, to n k. And uh, we just put them as a string into each row. <clears throat> and then we could just count them basically. So we could count in our whole data set, how many transitions do we have from state one to state one, from state one to state two and so on. And very, very conveniently, um, all of them seem to be available uh, um, in the same amount or in the same number, which is uh, not happening or which did not happen by um, chance. Instead, as I said in the beginning, we have this big data set available. However, we condensed it um, to have only a small data set and it was already uh, chosen in a way such that we have an even distribution here. So basically what you would observe if you load the big data set um, is that these are not evenly distributed. And this might in the end also lead to some problems um, or some uh, things you would have to reconsider when fitting a model, um, a function approximator on this, because you would have to uh, see that it might um, overfit more on the switching states, which are more often available. So it might uh, take them into account more. But we have a really, really nice data set. It seems it's really um, evenly distributed. Okay. So now that we have like um, our data acquisition, let's see, let's put a mark on here. We will go to the exploratory data analysis. There are any questions so far, go ahead. Okay. Yeah, so basically exploratory data analysis means, okay, we have we have our data, it's, uh, it's lying on our desk, so to say. And we want to see 
what's the structure of the data? How is it distributed? Is any data missing? This is in real world. Uh, scenarios, this is probably always the case. Something is your faulty data. Um, um, yeah, data might be missing, which you might have to in in interpolate, or you might have to remove some growth of your data set and so on and so forth. So you would want to have an in-depth look before you just go ahead and try to throw a model on it, um, because your data might, in the end, your model might become, um, might have a bad quality and the reason might be that your data is not really clean. So what we do here first is having a, um, a histogram over the switching states on the, on the, uh, at the time step k minus one and k. And what we can see once again, very conveniently is uh, that they are all very, equally distributed. Each of them has like 350,000 um, um, uh, happenings or each of them appears 350,000 times. Um, this is once again, just because we selected it this way. So very clean distribution here. Um, what we do next is like the like for these histograms, we also do histograms over all of the other um, columns which we have available. So the ID, IQ, Epsilon, and ID K plus one, IQ, Q plus, IQ, K plus one. And uh, what we can observe here, for example, is that ID is always negative and IQ is always positive, the same for K plus one. And um, you, as a data scientist, you might think, okay, this might be a problem, this might be a mistake. You would like to consult um, an expert here and they would explain to you that at least for ID being negative, this is um, wanted and this is um, this should be the case if the motor is controlled correctly. However, IQ could potentially also be negative. It seems like um, at least in this data set, the motor was not operated in such an operating point or this data was just selected to look like this. And um, we have all of these um, depicted here, depending on the switching state NK, which was applied on it. So divided by this, what we can observe is that epsilon, like the, the angle of the rotor seems to be uh, differently distributed depending on what switching state was applied. And once again, you might wonder, okay, why is this the case? And if you go and consult an expert, um, they would tell you, okay, yes. Um, depending on which epsilon we have, so depending on where the rotor is currently, um, which angle it has, where it's currently at this on the circle, um, you would go and apply different switching states. You wouldn't go and apply the same for each uh, epsilon. So it makes sense that distributions look different. So that means, okay, we seem to have no extreme values here, no um, data which seems to be too high or too low or anything. And all of these seem to be make sense to an expert. So you could say, okay, it seems like this is clean data. Um, we can go ahead to the next plot. And okay, we don't have a next plot, at least not yet. Um, now we have the first task. Um, where you were asked to add new features to the data frame and to also plot their distributions. Um, we wanted the sine and cosine of the rotor angle epsilon because I think it was from minus pi to pi. Yes, from minus three to three uh, roughly. And we wanted to have like a current vector norm as depicted here. And yeah, as we have introduced like a few cells back, you can just use this data frame dot assign and then define these inline functions. Or you could have also, what you could also have done was uh, like this um, dictionary like 
assignment to the data frame. And yeah, if you go and visualize it uh, additionally, so these first five columns here will be the, the old plots, and then the next four are the new plots, and they also don't look like anything strange is happening here so far. Okay, so these were the histogram plots. What you could also do, and what's also always recommendable, is um, to do some scatter plots, so just like point clouds. And what we have here is a huge plot where you have like the 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 switchings on the um, y-axis or on the uh, for the if you divide the plots on the y-axis, so to say. Uh, there you have the old switching states, and k minus 1. And on the x-axis where you divide the plots, you have the uh, switching states on the current time step, and k. And we have plotted here the currents. So basically what we have is like how uh, id to idk to idk plus 1, so to say. So how do they, who, how do the currents change from one step to another? in D and Q axis, depending on the switching states. Um, and as you can see, uh, so ID is uh, blue, uh, it's always on the negative side, and IQ is an orange here, it's always on the positive side, at least in our data set. And this is looking uh, strongly linearly. So you could almost fit a line to this, especially when you have here, uh, when you apply switching state one, at the current time step, it seems like this can be almost be uh, perfectly estimated um, by a line um, or approximated. For the other switching states, um, it would not be as perfect. Um, we can see this might result in quite big errors here if you just uh, draw a line inside. However, um, you could still do so and have probably a at least a rough estimator because um, the, as you can see, all of them lie roughly on a line. And yeah, we will also later on do that. And we will also see that we can quite well see the this distribution here also on the errors then. And um, yeah, so why would that be? Yeah, let's talk about this now. Why would that be maybe interesting to have like this estimation? Because it might be if you are able to tell like what's my what's my current at the moment, like ID IQ, and what's my current at the next step, depending on which switching state I apply, then you could easily, if you know that, then you could go and control your motor. So maybe you are have a current at the moment ID, and you want at the next step, you know which current you want to have, ID k plus one, and you just have to know, okay, which switching state do I have to take? So this might indeed be uh, an interesting thing to investigate, and might inter uh, indeed also be helpful to design a controller for it. So um, might be an interesting problem to throw a function approximator on. Um, what we also have, and what's also always might be interesting to have a look at, because then um, is uh, the linear correlation. Because if you have strongly correlated variables in the end, this might mean that you can um, that you maybe have columns which are not needed. Because if you have two columns which are almost perfectly correlated, then one of them is redundant and redundant. And also, if you want to estimate different, uh, if you have a column which we would like to estimate using a function approximator, and you see this column is strongly correlated to another column, then that means that you can probably use a linear estimator to use one of these columns to estimate the other one. And then you don't have to like use 
deep neural networks uh, with their slow execution time and their different convergence prob uh, difficult convergence properties and so on. So you, it might just be fine to use a least squares algorithm, for example. And yeah, if we apply this linear correlation analysis uh, using the Pearson correlation coefficient, um, just as a small explanation, if you didn't know so far, um, Pearson correlation official, F -F coefficient um, tells you how well one variable can be described linearly by another. And if the coefficient is one, this means it can be perfectly positively described linearly by the other variable. And if it's minus one, that means my variable can be negatively perfectly described linearly by the other variable. So let's say absolute high absolute values mean strong linear uh, correlation. And if we go and plot these uh, coefficients here for our columns, what we can observe and uh, which shows that this plot seems to be correct is that ID is uh, negatively correlated to I norm and IQ is positively correlated to I, I norm, at least somewhat, not with uh, the value of one, but uh, with a higher value than the average here. Um, and this makes a lot of sense because our I norm was um, the sum of the, or the square root of the sum of the squared ID and IQ. And since ID is always negative and IQ is always positive, this will lead to a negative or positive correlation. And what we can also observe is that ID at the current time step and ID at the next time step, as well as IQ on the current time step and IQ on the next time step seem to be somewhat correlated, not perfectly, but somewhat. And this also makes sense looking at these plots. So we have a somewhat linear distribution here. Um, yes, so this is for this exercise, our EDA. So Let's say in real life, you would probably not have this clean data. You would probably have to do, do a lot of pre-processing, data cleaning, maybe lots more, a lot, a lot more investigations. So for example, um, if you had the original data set, what you could also do is like time series plots since all of these currents come, uh, since all of this is like a big time series or many different time series plots, uh, let's say, as, um, how do you say, measurements. Um, you could plot all of them and have a look at what happens. And then you could maybe also see that there are some problems happening, like uh, currents are jumping too high from one time step to the next, or anything happens which you would not expect. And then you would might also have to do some cleaning of the artifacts which you have there. But we will not do this in this small data set and in this exercise. However, I just want to say, it's not like in, in the real world when you have a data set that you just do a, a histogram plot, um, a scatter plot, and maybe linear correlation, and then you are done and you can go to modeling. Usually you would probably have to do, uh, to put a lot more work into it. Okay. If there are no further questions, then I will go to the next section which is uh, the cross-validation. So we now have seen our data. We think, okay, it's looking nice. It's looking good. It's cleaned. Uh, we are now quite confident that it's uh, correct. Um, now we would like to start the modeling. Like we want to have a model which uh, estimates anything in our, in our, of our data, whatever is the goal. And what we want, what we have to decide before we do that is our cross validation method. So because, um, yeah, we want to validate that the model, which we are, which we are using to estimate our data, um, is actually able to generalize well. And for this, you have learned in the lecture of the K fold cross validation, where you just 
split your training set into different folds and train on all of these folds but one and then use this one fold which you haven't trained on to see what the performance and what you would also usually do so we are in this exercise we will utilize um, five fold cross validation as depicted here uh, what you would also usually do is like um, to have a test set which you keep, uh, which you don't use for this cross validation scheme that you can use later on, maybe for uh, hyperparameter optimization or to evaluate the final performance of your model. Um, however, we will, or uh, this is not done in this exercise. So we just uh, concentrate on the scaffold scheme and use it as a measure for how well our model is able to generalize using these validation errors. And yeah, for the scaffold, we uh, just use the, the sklearn library. And as you can see here, we uh, you can just have a kfold object uh, where you state how many splits you want and whether you want to shuffle the data um, probably every time you use this kfold. Okay. Then what would we like to do and with this data set? We would like to do a regression task. Um, and we want to, uh, what we want to estimate is the next ID and the next IQ and the next I norm. So as I've stated, it, this might be um, interesting to have if we are able to estimate these because these might allow us to um, control the motor or maybe to or even just to understand it better and before we will start what we will do is um, some feature engineering or we want to show you how you can do it um, in terms of tools um, and for this we have this huge enriched data frame here which is probably a little too big um, however what we wanted to show you is how to add new features and how in what manner these can be done so for example these first i don't know 15 features maybe or 20 are non-task specific features so we just in some way or another added um very uh, columns which we already had available and made them um, non-linear. So for example, by squaring IDK, by squaring IQK, taking the exponential of them and so on and so forth, the logarithm. So these, so you don't need to have any expert knowledge about your system to do, to use these kind of features. Um, you can just add them and see whether they yield some more positive results, especially since now in the beginning, we are using a linear um, regression and linear estimator. Um, this, it might be important to do like this kind of nonlinear transformation of your input features so that this uh, linear model is able to estimate better. Um, however, what we also added here is um, features which are taken from this paper as stated in this comment. They have been found out using domain knowledge, expert knowledge, and probably also some trial and error, I would assume. And you can try if you want to, to not use these features. And what you will observe is, at least for the neural network, that it will be much worse. So someone found using um, yeah, expert knowledge, found a good number of features which they can use here to uh, improve the estimation quality of the final model um, a lot. And yes, so you can use non-task specific features, you can use task specific features. And here we have un uh, commented some features with the with rhetoric 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 question whether these features are problematic because they are using the whole data set so we have 
like we take we add a new feature with which just takes the mean over the whole data set of id we take the mean over the whole data set of iq and we do all of this for each switching state too and yeah this is problematic uh, which is why we commented this year um, because what we will do in kfold uh, in the k-fold cross-validation is that we have only a subset of our data set at the training set and then we have a small validation set which lies to the side and you don't want to have information from the validation set inside the training set because it might mean that in the end that your model is working better on your validation set than it usually would so that you are too optimistic about the generalizability of your model. So you could add these features, but you should only do it on the training, uh, on the training features, or only use it using it use only use the da training data to generate these mean values. So what you you could do this after splitting. Um, after doing the split. So for example, what we have here now in this training loop is that we uh, do the k-fold split of our enriched data frame. And now we generate our x-train and x-test and y-test and y-train data by uh, using this train and the index and test index. And now after we have the x-train, we could calculate these values using x train that would be an approach which you could definitely do and then you could use these features to do the um, estimation or the regression so using linear regression i think we also take this model here from sklearn yes so we have from sklearn we take the linear regression and also as an as an error metric we use the mean squared error and we just go ahead, take our data and try to fiddle, fit a linear model. And yeah, it's pretty bad. <laughs> so basically what we see over the five different folds is that um, the mean squared error of ID and IQ is, yeah, for ID it's over 4,000 pairs squared. Um, for IQ it's like 3,700 and for I norm it's one. 3,300, so this is around 200 amperes or a little less um, well, absolute error on average. This is tremendously bad. And the reason for this is not solely because we use a linear regression here, but um, we are also doing some mistakes. And yeah, this is also what the second task is about. Like, what did we do wrong? And how can we get a lot more out of this um, linear regression model? And in the lecture, you had, you learned about different schemes, which you should always apply when dealing with machine learning. One of them is uh, normalization. And the other is, how to deal with categorical data. So as in, with an example of one using one hard encoding, I think you also learned different schemes here. So what did we do wrong? First of all, we had these, um, as I mentioned in the beginning, we had these switching states and they had values from, I think it was one to eight and for eight different switching states and the linear model assumes that eight is higher than one. So it assumes that there is some ordinal, um, uh, yeah, that it is some kind of ordinal variable and that uh, there is some kind of meaning when one variable is higher than the other, that this should be uh, reconsidered by the model. However, this is not true. Um, it's completely arbitrary how, the different switching states are mapped 
to integers. So what we want to do first is we want to do we want to somehow deal with this, and we can do this by doing one hot hot encoding. So basically, what we have in the beginning is like we have one, two, till eight, and you map this to one vector. For example, if we want to map two, which is then one zero one. Oh, sorry for my handwriting here. Five, six, seven, and is it? Yes, and H. Probably. No, this should be fine. Maybe it's transposed. I don't know. Um, so basically, you want to encode this. So you would have seven new features instead of just the switching state. You would now have eight different states and each of these uh, eight different columns and each of these columns is either zero or one and it's one when uh, your switching state is of that category and it's zero when it's not of that category and so this is using this is basically the normalization scheme to deal with categorical data and to deal with um, non-categorical data with our floating point data. There are different uh, scaling schemes, so standard scaling, min max scaling, and plane scaling. And in our solution here, we use uh, the min max scalar from sklearn. But as you can see, uh, the standard scalar is already um, imported. So you could also go ahead and maybe try this one and see whether it yields <coughs> different results. And here, yeah, what we can observe is, that our yeah, regression or estimation quality is still not that great. However, compared to what we have had before, this is much, much better. So um, yeah, this was tremendously helpful already and shows why it's important to do these kind of, to use these kind of schemes. And what I also want to uh, mention here, because we talked about this before when um, with, the, with the global features, when you do this min-max scaling, um, what you can see is we calculate the minimum, the maximum, and the minimum, yeah, okay. And once again, the minimum over a column, um, over the whole data set here, which means <clears throat> what you should actually do is, you want to use your min max scalar only on the training set. So to calculate min max min. This is done here by using this fit transform. So basically on this, the fit part of it means we are calculating min and max based on this train, x train. And then you want to transform your test data or your validation data using the same, the name, the same minimum and maximum values as uh, on the training set, because your model will now expect um, will now expect this normalization scheme. So it's important to do to divide this to when you do your scaling. Mm, what we can do now once we have this model is have a look at the errors or the residuals. So for each, what we can see for each IDs from minus 300 to zero, how um, how high is the error in Ampere, the same for IQ and the same for I norm. And what we can see is that it's quite high for one, on one hand, and on the other hand, it has these uh, yeah interesting shapes. Like we can see for IQ that the estimation error is very high for high IQs. And what we can observe in our plots, if we scroll up a little again, is that this also makes sense. So for example, if I try to uh, draw a line through this, it would probably lead to a big error here in this, uh, in this Q for IQ in this upper right corner. So what we have guessed before um, is also visible here. And 
we would like for, let's say for an optimal estimator, we would expect the error to look like a white noise instead of having these systematic um, errors here because our data is real data and real data or real measurement systems are always a little noisy. So you never have perfect data or noise might also be inflicted when you digitalize your measurements. So you will never have a perfect regressor or estimator. Um, but if it's as good as possible, then the residuals should look like white noise around uh, the, the error zero. And we will later see for the neural networks um, that uh, they are somewhat better capable of giving us these kind of residuals. Okay, any questions so far? Good. If that's not the case, then let's go ahead into our last chapter here, which is neural networks. So what we've done so far is we used a linear model, try to estimate the next, uh, the current at the next time step. And we saw that a linear estimator is yeah, having a systematic error, error and is also from the uh, regression quality, um, yeah, it's, not that great. So <clears throat> what we will use now is um, neural networks. I think I also have a slide for this. Yes. Um, as they were introduced in the lecture, we will use a simple feed forward neural network because we don't have any time rows here or anything which we could um, yeah, utilize more, more advanced uh, architectures on. And we will use PyTorch for this. Maybe first of all, this is um, our class definition for our for a simple feed forward network using PyTorch. <clears throat> you can always use this kind of structure um, for your own code too. So um, as I said, you will need neural networks and probably just, or pretty sure just feed forward networks for your exam task, so you can build them in a very similar way. Sorry. <clears throat> um, so what's happening here? Basically, we are building here our neural network sequentially. So sequentially means we have here our first layer, then oh, this is probably just the input values. That means here we have our first layer, this is our second layer and so on and so forth. And they are built sequentially from the input to the output. So it's the same here for this PyTorch definition. We have a sequential definition. And first of all, we define ourselves a linear layer. So basically, if we, if we do not consider activation functions, you have learned about this in the lecture, um, then the, the, the uh, calculation in a neural network in one layer is basically just a linear um, calculation based on the layer weights. So W plus a bias B. And what we define here is now a linear layer and the input dimension to that layer has, uh, the input size is of the input dimension and the output size is 32. So basically what does that mean? We have here our input vector, which is our feature vector. And at the output of this layer, um, so basically at the output of this layer, we will have 32 values, which means there are 32 new, one, new ones in this layer. Then what we have is what do, else do we add to this sequential, um, yeah, how would you say to this sequential neural network um, is the ReLU function. And um, yeah, you talked about this in the lecture, so I stole these figures from there. You need in order for your neural network to be really nonlinear, to be able to estimate nonlinear functions, 
you will also you will need nonlinear activation functions because otherwise you will just have a linear estimator. And we are in this lecture utilizing the ReLU, which just um, yeah makes every values smaller than zero to zero, and just uh, gives so just keeps all of the values which are um, bigger than zero. So we add this here after the first layer. So maybe we can in our here we can say we have now 32 values. Then before the next layer, we apply ReLU. Oh, pretty ugly, but so this is done here. <clears throat> and then we have another layer, which now takes as an input 32. So the 32 values which we have from the from the first layer and output three values. So basically this layer no it wouldn't be this one it's uh, since it's already our last layer let's remove this be this layer so we don't have any other intermediate layers this layer would then be three values and as you can see, we don't have any other activation function after this. So um, yeah, no nonlinear calculations are done here. And we want to have three values at the output because we are estimating ID, K, ID at point K plus one, IQ at point K plus one, and I norm at point K plus one. That means um, we want to estimate three values. That's why our neural network has to output three values in the end. Okay, so we also have some auxiliary functions defined here, such that in the end, this training loop will not look too cluttered, um, which is basically prepare data, which just adds use, uh, uses this min max scaling that we have talked about before and transforms like the train and test data to it for each fold. So we will do k fold training again. And we have this learn function. So basically in PyTorch, what do you need in order to train a neural network? So for once you will need an optimizer. What is, you might ask, what's an optimizer? We have here depicted, uh, we have here used for the optimizer, this Adam. Um, and basically what was introduced in the lecture was stochastic gradient descent. And you could also, I think you could also do this here. Let's see whether it goes to optimum point stochastic gradient descent. Yeah, let's see, maybe that would work already. So what you could also do was would be something like this. And then you would have, oh, it's not loading. Ah, oh, no, it is. Then you would use like vanilla stochastic gradient descent as depicted in the lecture. However, um, as I think it was also already said in the lecture, stochastic gradient descent is, has like different extensions available. And one of these is, and this optimizer is used very, let's say it's one of the most popular optimizers. Um, one of them is Adam and Adam uses um, like momentum and different uh, techniques to improve on stochastic gradient so that it doesn't stay in local minima. So what we need is some kind of algorithm to do the, uh, to do the optimization of our neural network of the parameters. And what we can see in this learn function is that before we learn, we call this optimizer zero grad, <clears throat> which just means we are removing all of the gradients which we might still have. And then later what we do is an optimizer step, which just means we are using the gradients and doing a parameter update. Um, yeah, what else do we need? We need a model um, that's clear. So our model is using an input, our input data and generates an output. and what else do we need? Uh, what, what we also need is like uh, a loss measurement. So 
as we have defined before in um, in the linear case, uh, we will use the mean squared error here. And then we can calculate the loss based on the output of the neural network and our desired, um, our, let's say our desired output, the, the ground truth. And yes, yeah, so what we do here now is once again, we have this uh, k-fold split. For each fold, we will generate a new feedforward model because we want to reset all of its parameters. Um, we will have a new optimizer because this optimizer, we, the atom optimizer is a little more complex that remembers how many optimization steps were already done and uh, changes its internal parameters based on it. And yeah, then we just get our train and test set, uh, prepare the data. We also use some data set, uh, data loader here from PyTorch. I think you will never, uh, in, in reinforcement learning problems, you will not use this usually. So you just, you can just accept that we use them here. You don't have to understand how they work. However, we use these to, uh, load our data here. And then we just, train for yeah different uh, epochs. I think you also learned about this in the lecture. So basically going through the whole data set means one epoch. And we train for, I think, 10 epochs here, epochs. Um, and we just uh, update our model, basically using this learn function. And in the end, what we will do is we will just um, get the prediction of our model, see how well it does on the test tensor and uh, calculate the mean squared error here. And maybe what's also important uh, in the future also for you is what we use here is this with torch.nograd. And this just means that everything that comes afterwards um, is, or inside, what comes inside is um, there's no gradient calculated. So basically, for example, if you do this semi gradient methods, um, that you talked about today in the lecture, you will might want to estimate a value using your model, but you don't want to use it for the loss. And you can do this using this with torch.nograd. So everything you calculate in here, you will not use for the loss function. And so, yeah, using this, you can also use semi-gradient methods, for example. You will see how this is done in uh, future exercises. Okay, so now using our small neural network, so it's really not that big, and training it uh, 10 epochs and using a batch size of 64, Oh yeah, you also, sorry, I didn't say this so far. You can also, you also always need a batch size. So you will always give uh, the the neural network, like um, not the whole data set, the whole training set, but instead you would give it like a, a small amount of it, train the network on it, and then sample another small amount of your data set and so on and so forth until your data set is exhausted. And then one epoch is done. So then you go to the next one. So you, this is another hyperparameter which you have to tune and keep in mind. Uh, another one would be, which is also very important, maybe we should have, what would have been better is if we have defined it here, is the learning rate. I would, I would even say it's probably the most important single, singular um, hyperparameter. So your whole training might diverge or converge based on only the learning rate. And so this would be another parameter which is important to tune. And if, for example, you are unhappy with the performance of your training, um, then you could go ahead and try to change this parameter either by trying, by trial and error or using a systematic approach. And yeah, if you uh, use this routine to train on our known problem. What you can observe is that we have very, very small errors at every fold, at least compared to what we had before. So before, I think we were in the hundreds of ampere squared, 
And now we are like a uh, single digit digit um, error margins. And yeah, this is very impressive. Shows that this is probably more of a nonlinear problem and that the neural network is able to estimate or to, yeah, to solve this regression task quite well. And when plotting the res residuals, you can see it's not perfect white noise. I mean, maybe the, the measurement error is also not perfect white noise, we don't know. However, it's already looking quite evenly distributed here. So uh, much better than the linear estimation, at least on this problem. And yes, um, giving us everything we want, at least on this problem. There might be problems which are actually linear. And if your problem is linear, then a linear estimator is probably also better than neural networks. Yeah, so once again, I want to emphasize on that using any deep learning library will be very important from now on and also for your exam task. So I would say go ahead if you haven't really understood everything that's shown here for now and try to understand it and try to yeah, maybe write your own code and see how you can deal with all of this, how you can do, how you can maybe um, implement changes. And so that you are in the future able to uh, use these kind of techniques yourself for your exam task. And yeah, maybe also for the exercises which you might do. Okay, are there any questions? Okay, if that's not the case, then I will end this here.